Okay, so welcome everybody. We're going to continue our study of stewardship as revealed in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is, is the focus. Uh, and it's titled A Model First Century Stewardship Program. And our session one focus that we're going to continue with and finish today is what is Christian stewardship? And the emphasis is, is on Christian, right? As, as a believer, as a, a person of faith, that, that aspect of, of stewardship as a Christian is what we are focusing on. The purpose of doing this, as we know, when we get into God's Word, the Holy Spirit works within us. So we're giving God, the Holy Spirit, the opportunity to teach us and to also help us apply to our own hearts uh, the basic truths about a Christian stewardship of treasures, Pick up now. right? Pick up now. And through this, we're going to be encouraged, right? We encourage each other, but we're going to be encouraged to be more faithful and more committed stewards of all that God has given to us. That that's the goal, right? It is to 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 be encouraged. So to review where we've been before we get into the review, actually, I remembered now versus ten minutes in. We start with the prayer, any prayer requests uh, that we have before we start today. Anybody want to? Any prayer requests? No? Okay, I'll say a quick prayer before we uh, begin. Lord, we, we give you praise and we give you thanks for all that you've have done for us, your wisdom in bringing us together at this point in time. Uh, we confess our need for you and our need to continually uh, be refined through your word. Um, and we ask for your blessing uh, today as we uh, look at the truths of what it is to be good stewards of uh, the time that you've given to us, um, the abilities that you've given to us, the treasures that you've given to us. Help us to, uh, to, to learn it and to grow more in using these things uh, to honor you and to advance your kingdom. Uh, bless us today and always. We ask these things through Jesus' name, our Savior. Amen. Okay. Uh, uh, first, last night, for those that were here for the Harvest Fest, thank you to everybody who was involved with that. That was a lot of fun. I heard the Jurassic Park car was the one that it ultimately won, which is pretty cool. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for those uh, that were here. Obviously, you know how, how fun it was. I, I don't know, for years past, it seemed like that was a ton of people. I don't know if you guys kept a record. It was or a little bit more than average. More than average, yeah. Awesome. So, um, with that being said, uh, reviewing where, where we've been. We started last week looking at uh, the first two like truths uh, of stewardship and of these things. The first thing we looked at was... The fact that a proper understanding of Christian stewardship begins with the understanding that stewardship is a part of uh, uh, the Christian's life of sanctification. So this is this is a part of our lives as as believers, right? Um, we start with with that aspect. Number two, we were looking at the fact that we have the old the old Adam, the old man within us that is always there. Um, and sanctification, unlike the, the doctrine of justification that God has declared all of the world forgiven, right? And that we're declared righteous through faith. That's an instant thing. That's, that's happened. Uh, the difference in sanctification is, is this idea that this is a process that is always incomplete, right? Now, as, as believers, this... Our life of sanctification is, is always incomplete. And I, I'm probably not going to say the Latin right, but Luther said, we are at the same time righteous and a sinner, right? We we're both at the same time. The Latin term was simul justice et peccator, or somebody else that might know Latin better than me. That, that, that idea, right? That we're, we could also say sinner and saint at the same time. Um, and as we were talking, the facts of that sometimes can be pretty depressing 
right? If we just look at the, we look at our flesh, we look at our the old self within us. It's it's a sobering reality. We we realize how you know sinful we are, how how, how far we've fallen. Um, but at the same time, we can rejoice. We can still now. Uh, really rejoice in our new in the new life we have within us and that's what we're going to be looking at more today the third truth that growth in sanctification um, or Christian stewardship if, if we call it that occurs as the new man the, the new person within us gains ascendancy over the old man right the the, the new life within us now we're becoming now more What's the word I could use? Stronger within who we are as, as, as believers, right? The growth that happens comes through using God's law and his gospel. Properly using those two things. So we're going to finish with that. And then we're ultimately going to see that God-pleasing stewardship flows from the gospel. From the good news, right? Of, of what God has done to save us. That's the motivation. That's that's where we get the God pleasing uh, works that we do, and that's really ultimately we need both. But that's how we how we view things uh, as we move forward, right? It's Christ's love compels us, right? We think of that that scripture in Romans. It's it's now we offer our bodies, our lives as living sacrifices, right? We we see it in that respect. So. Questions as before we uh, move in, as we were reviewing things from last week or clarifications or anything. <coughs> okay, we we left off uh, right. I got it. Yeah, right. I think uh, right before truth three. Right, we were just getting into truth truth three. So on your sheets there, I think we're on page four. Page four. Page four. Thank you. So we start with the purpose of the law. We have Romans three and then Romans 6. If we can get a volunteer for Romans 3. Bibles. Oh, Bibles, thank you, sorry. <laughs> thank you, everybody. <laughs> if you're going to use your uh, smart device, uh, we do have a couple uh, NIVs, but the English Heritage version, if you're going to use Bible Gateway or another source, English Heritage version is our translation. Uh, there you go. I have a secretary, Gary. Okay. In our format, we'll do uh, a variety of lecture, uh, whole group discussion, as you guys are uh, familiar with, and then we'll also do some small group discussion as well um, as we look into uh, different sections and then come back and share together. But we'll start with a whole group first. Uh, Romans 3.20, who, who uh, is at Romans... 3.20 and then Romans 6.23. Yep. Purpose of the law. Romans 3.20. For, for this reason no one will be declared righteous in his sight by works of the law. For through the law we become aware of sin. Okay. So the purpose of God's law. What's that purpose we see there, right? We remember this truth. We become aware of our sin. Yeah, conscious of our sin. We're, we're aware of it, right? And I know when we were discussing, uh, like, the last week, kind of like, man, like, when we look at ourselves through the law, it, 
in trying to follow God's ways through the law, we, we see really how far short we've fallen. Sobering. It's kind of depressing, right? But there's a purpose for it to, to help us see, right, something that, that we need we need help. We also see something in the law that shows us what we deserve or the threat of the law, and that comes in Romans 6.23. I'd like to share through Romans 6.23. Thank you, Bonnie. The wages of sin is death, but the undeserved gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we see both law and gospel there, the gospel in a nutshell, if you will. But the law there, what, is it, what does it threaten us with? What does it show us that we really have earned? Death. 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 Eternal death. Separation, right, from God. Right? That's, that's what we... And we, we do need to be reminded of that. Right? <clears throat> We, we need that reminder ultimately to, to, but it also then gives us, and as we're going to see here more now, even a better appreciation for our Savior and for the gospel. So we see the law's effect on Christian stewardship. The first uh, point there, the law can never with all its commands, threats, and promises produce a single good work. The old man can only be put to death, not reformed. So through our obedience of the law, right, we, we can't do things that please God through our obedience. It only shows us, right, uh, those things. And the law can't produce the good work of Christian stewardship. And that's, again, the lens. I know when we look through that lens, that's the depressing part of it. Man, like, I can't do it. Uh, the law can and should be used to point uh, specific sins that militate against sound stewardship practices such as greed, covetous, covetousness, and materialism. And the, the example that's given there is Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 21. It's the parable of the rich fool. And we, we can take, take a minute uh, real quick to read through Luke 12, 13 to 21. Parable of the rich fool. And then we also, in the next one, are going to see 1 Corinthians 16, uh, 2. So let's take maybe two, three minutes at your table groups. We're going to have uh, Luke 12, 13 to 21. And then, I don't know if this one's printed or not. But in the second point, the law serving as the purpose of guiding, we're going to view that from 1 Corinthians 16.2. And then Luke... to 21. So let's take this three minutes real quick, read through that, discuss um, a little bit on our tables uh, what, we, what we see there. And set my timer. Yeah, sorry, Corinthians 16.2. 16.2. 
sin. What do we see there? What's the warning in the example of the rich fool there? Materialism. You can't fill your U-Haul and take it with you. <laughs> True. Yeah. <laughs> Spiritual U-Haul. Yeah, I've heard the one, uh, do you ever see, you know, the U-Haul behind the hearse? You know, at, at the funeral, right? You never do, right? You can't, you can't bring it with you. Um, storing up all those things for ourselves, right? And, and making that your because, like it says at the end, what's, we could. Yeah. So obviously, materialism and take and and just that that desire for just more and more. Now in Corinthians, we see more of a, the example of the guide. What do we see in the Corinthians passage, uh, sixteen two? Who wants to share that one? It's kind of a guidance for. If anybody has it, if you want to read it real quick. Which one is it? Uh, Corinth, 1 Corinthians uh, 16 2. So, uh, on the first day of the week, each of you is to set something aside, including it with whatever he gains, saving it up at home so that when I come, as Paul, no collections will need to be carried out. So, on the first day of the week. Yeah. So, there we see more of the example, right? The guidance for giving. And we're going to get into the motivation of that as we. Uh, move move forward, but we see it a uh, guidance. We do get an example of um, right the guide through God's commands, um, but again, that's motivated through the gospel. So we're going to look now into the purpose of the gospel, and we're going to have Matthew nine, First Peter one, and John fifteen. So what's the purpose now of the gospel in our in our lives as we're moving forward? What's the role? And let's take another three minutes. First Peter one twenty three, and then John 
15. Okay, guys, so let's take a look. Who has Matthew 9, 13? Who wants to share Matthew 9, the, the gospel's announcement to us and conveyance to us as sinners? Go ahead, Naomi. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So the gospel announces what to us? It announces mercy, mercy forgiveness, right? announcing that it's it's giving that to us and then through the gospel and through that announcement what does god uh, bring about through that in first peter uh, 1 23 go ahead bill <clears throat> for you have been born again not a perishable seed but a imperishable through the living and enduring word of god so the gospel is bringing about what it within us yeah, yeah. It, the change the, the new birth, the new life within us, right? You've been given birth. So the gospel's announcing that it's it's uh, bringing about new life within us, and I, I like that term of you know birth, right? Because if you think about that that new life now, in that new life, First Peter, or excuse me, uh, John fifteen five. It's giving us, it's empowering us. Go ahead, Margie. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him is the one who bears much fruit because without me you can do nothing. So we're connected to Jesus and that's the only way we can exist. <laughs> yeah, and we're producing what then? Through being connected fruit. to Jesus. Fruit and faith. Yeah. Fruit. And did anybody look up Galatians 2.20? It also uh, describes it. Bonnie, go ahead. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I am now living in the flesh, I live it by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So I, so no, no longer I, right, but Christ. That, that's our motivation. Which, in contrast, I, I would say to to the other motivation, which would be, when we looked at, if you remember... Uh, we looked at like improper motivations for stewardship last time, right? Like wanting to do it for self-glory or, or what other people would think of me or all these different motivations maybe that aren't bad on the surface, but they're not motivated by what God has done for us, that the motivation is different. Here we find, find that purpose. Here we can bear that, that fruit. So the purpose. So now uh, when we look into the gospel's effect now on Christian stewardship. So, so this idea of, of 
how we're living our lives, right, and, and, our, and being continually refined, the gospel is going to produce a I will rather than I must attitude towards stewardship. I, I want to do this. I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. I, it, out of thanks for my Savior, I, I, I want to do this. And the example of Zacchaeus, uh, 19, uh, Luke 19, 1 to 10, we can kind of paraphrase it, unless somebody wants to actually read that one. It's, it's, let me see, actually, I think I'm right there. I'll, I'll get that one for us. Uh, Luke, <clears throat> this is the example of Zacchaeus. I know we're familiar. 19. So it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man named Zacchaeus was there. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but since he was short, he could not see because of the crowd. He ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Jesus because he was about to pass by that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down and come down, for I must stay at your house today. He came down quickly and welcomed Jesus. When the people saw it, they were grumbling against because he went to be a guest of a sinful man. Zacchaeus stood up and said, Lord, Lord, I'm going to give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So, in summer, what do we know about tax collectors? Zacchaeus was part of this group. What do we know about them? Yeah, and and Zacchaeus, it says, because he was living that way, was a bit, he got really rich off of it, right? So we, we know that about ta and tax collectors were they weren't they weren't respected, right? So Zacchaeus, though, uh, he he didn't look at when he heard about Jesus. Oh, I have to give all this. He he realized something, obviously, right, about who he who Jesus was, his own sinfulness, and the attitude that he, what did he say in, in the example? He said, if I cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times as much. I just love how spontaneous it is with Zacchaeus. And, and Jesus doesn't even, you know, Zacchaeus could have said twice, I'll pay it back twice, two times as much, or I'll just pay him back. Jesus just accepted it because it came just that spontaneous, right? Jesus could have said, you Ding bad Zacchaeus, you can afford eight times as much. Come on, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it's just there, right? Because it's big. That's that's cool. Yeah, and it was that that I will attitude, that I, that idea within, right? That this is what I want to do out of thanks for salvation. And the next example, uh, the gospel produces genuine, even lavish displays of Christ honoring love. And we see Luke 7, 36 to 50. It's a longer account, but uh, somebody want to get Luke 7, 36 to 50. It's about 14 verses. It's the sinful woman anointing Jesus. And then we also see in John 12, 1 through 8, uh, Mary's anointing of Jesus. And maybe we, since these are a little longer, actually, maybe we can take about three minutes real quick. Um, pick one of them for your table. Read, read through Luke 7, 36 to 50, or John 12, 1 through 8. And let's do, let's do it that way. Quick, uh, small group, three minutes, and then we'll discuss.
You, 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 did you get one? Yeah. You might as well have both of them. Oh, yes. I saw both of them. Yeah. They both here today? Both are here. Both mantras? Yeah. I saw them. They're, they're, they're noisy. Jeez. Jeez. It's really crazy. Yeah. 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 There's our time. So, <clears throat> our notes say that the gospel produces generous, lavish displays of Christ honoring love. Generous, like these incredible displays of Christ honoring love. And our first example in Luke 7, let's, who wants to share the summary there of the, we have the sinful woman here being the who anoints Jesus. What do we see in this example in Luke 7? What do we know about this account? Go ahead. He calls her a sinful woman, which they were just probably juxtaposing the Pharisee idea to, and she comes in full of wanting to, I mean, she's weeping, she's crying, she washes his feet with her tears and her hair, kisses his feet. Um, and basically, Jesus uses that, as, uses that as a lesson. So who, you know, who had who had the more debt to be paid? Right. You know, it's kind of like the Pharisees didn't think they had any because they were righteous. But this yeah. woman realized. Yeah. Um, so just, I don't. Know, I just read. You know, she just knew how much she wanted to pay back, so to speak, and serve Jesus. Right. She knew how much she had been forgiven. Right. And she goes way like way overboard. I mean. Tears and hair and feet and yeah. <laughs> perfume and all of that, all that. And the attitude, of, <laughs> the attitude of the Pharisee when he sees this is like, is is what is? Jesus, you're yeah, like like, and then isn't it, it isn't it even if you knew what this woman was about, like, or what you would you would? Yeah. Why why is she doing this? And then he goes on to give the example, right, of the of the debts, right. Alabaster, is that expensive? I, I think, yeah, alab Alabaster, probably, and Pastor might give some insight. It, wasn't it like a, a very expensive, like even like a year's worth of wages? It, it was... I looked up pure nard, and you can buy an ounce of pure nard today on Amazon for $9. She gave 327 ounces, so a little bit under $3,000 worth of perfume. And in those days... There was no indoor plumbing and showers, sure. so this this was like really important for your for yourself, right? To to give that out. <laughs> but 
again, she she sees hey uh, because I guess if we use that contrast too, right? Of of the perfume, you know. Well, Jesus cleanses us of all the of more than just the stink of our armpits, right? Of our sins, right? And she she saw that, and I think what a lesson for all of us too, right? With with our own lives, uh, when we see. We all have the old man within us where we, we have our own like ideas of self-righteousness and other people being this and that, but ultimately we're all that. We've all been cleansed in the same way, and the, the example there, wow, pretty incredible. Other thoughts on Luke 7 as we are looking at the just lavish displays of, of shown love? Um, the true... Christ honoring love comes through a realization that you have been grace through, through Christ rather than um, your own actions. And so it's more from the gospel side rather than the law side. Yeah. Yeah, she wasn't doing all those things to get the grace and forgiveness. She, she already she realized she was given that. Right? And, and now... That that's that's our response, right? When we look at truly, it's it's what's been done for us. Good. Other example. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking too. Just like, wonder how socially awkward this whole situation was. So you're trying to have dinner, and this woman is carrying on, but you know nobody stops her because Jesus doesn't stop her. So I think like, like, what's what. What's in your heart to do? And if it's if the motivation is, is pure, then do it. You know, Jesus doesn't stop it. And how many times have I inadvertently or advertently, <laughs> you know, limited somebody's response to the gospel because it broke with social norm or it broke with my comfort level or whatever, you know. We used, we were talking about the example of somebody how would we feel if somebody just stood up in the middle of the church and just shouted hallelujah because they were so filled with joy, right? I think it would all shock us. <laughs> yeah. We wouldn't know what to do, right? We wouldn't pick the person up or anything, but I just thought, wow, I it would take me a few minutes to get back on track with the sermon after that because it would just shock me so much. But do we, does that then inadvertently tell that person, oh, you you violated our culture? Yeah. <laughs> right? True. Yeah. So, that just... Not to turn a good gospel thing here into a law thing, but it just it reminded me that, you know, again, just like with Zacchaeus, Jesus does not put a cap on somebody's gospel expression. You know, yeah. This is what they decided in their heart was the right thing to do, and they went and did it. I remember, um, nothing, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, occasionally you'll get somebody in counseling and they're, they're struggling with like an addiction or something like that, and they get to that point where they recognize that they're slaves and they're worshiping an idol, and you work through the process of repentance with them, and they are so filled with joy, they are ready to start a class for people to get out of addiction because they're so excited they just want to share it. And then what do we tell them? Well, no, you're not ready to do that yet. You're not properly trained. And I think sometimes we miss a little bit of an opportunity there. I mean, I, I see the caution there, too, but, but I also think, like, man, who better to demonstrate the joy of the gospel than somebody that has just recently discovered it in their life? And why don't we give that person a bigger bigger platform? So, yeah. think about that. Well, and I think, yeah, as we are looking at stewardship in general as a congregation, right, and ways in which we all are serving together and, and different ways that we can do that maybe being being open to maybe new new ways um, of living our faith right and sharing our faith and, and new ways of we always default to the way we've always done things but but why not have an open open mind and like you said, like with Jesus he he's at this guy's house right a affluent Pharisee and, and this had to have been something not out, not normal, and he lets lets it go, and and for so for, so us so, so we can see too. Hey, right? There's times when we can be be open to it. 
John or John 12, 1, 3, let's quickly go through that one. We see also another example. Uh, what do we see in those that had the John passage? It's Mary anointing Mary anointing Jesus. Anybody want to share? Or did everybody get it? I guess so. All, all since first time, so we can get through this one today. Um, it's Mary coming uh, six days before Passover. Jesus came to Bethany, uh, the hometown of Lazarus. Uh, they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving. Lazarus was uh, one of those reclining at the table. Then Mary took 12 ounces of very expensive perfume, pure nard, and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, was going to betray him. Why wasn't this sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He did not say this because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. He held the money box and used it, used to steal what was put in it. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She intended to keep this for the day of my burial. Indeed, the poor you will always have with you, but you you are not always going to have me. Uh, so what do we see there, right? The kind of uh, the other, oh, well, don't use that money for, for anointing Jesus. Use it for, obviously, the, the selfishness within Judas, right? Um, what do we what do we see? What was coming to your mind as you were hearing that? Like the example again of generous, lavish displays of Christ honoring love. We see, I guess, the the ladies uh, in the previous account of her her actions and also of giving of, of the wealth. What do we see here? Same kind of thing. It's yeah. it's uh, three hundred three hundred days worth of wages of uh, perfume being poured on Jesus' feet by Mary. So yeah. I don't know what people make per per day. Right. Like Hundred bucks a day or something times three hundred. So it's like sixty thousand dollars worth of perfume being poured on. So no wonder no wonder Judas wanted to keep it for himself. Yeah. And I mean, I wonder in that just as I was reading and thinking the not to say that we shouldn't we, we shouldn't have reserves in our funds as, as a body of believers but I think maybe sometimes oh like let's keep that not that we want to keep it greedily like Judas for our own personal selves but let's not do this this different thing or the, this this way of honoring God right or reaching out with the gospel let's not do that maybe is kind of what I was thinking. Versus God's given us all that we have, all, all the blessings, all the treasures we have. You continue to do that. And it doesn't mean we're going to go out and liquidate the bank account. But at the same time, why not step out in in faith and, you know, yeah, and trust. And I, but nonetheless, any other thoughts? We got about... Uh, 12, 13 minutes before we are done for today. I do want us to get through. Uh, we're almost there. So motivation is what we're going to turn into truth for. The God-pleasing God stewardship flows from the gospel, not from the law. So we're seeing that. And we see this idea of motivation. Um, motivation is an incentive, uh, which... That which incites to action, right? Motivation uh, produces action. And then behavior is motivated, right? It's a pretty simple thing to think about. But the proper motivation of behavior, it's not always properly motivated, right? And this idea of motivation, so if we're motivated by the gospel, uh, and we can do this whole group to end. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Who wants to get Romans 12? Romans 12. And then we're going to... Uh, okay, Naomi. And then who wants to get 1 John 4, 19? 1 John 4, 19. Pastor, thanks. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 15. Josh, 
So again, uh, what is gospel motivation? What are we hearing in Romans? Um, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Okay, so gospel motive. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Okay, so gospel motivated behavior is behavior that. The last part, it doesn't conform to the ways of this world, right? It, it's not. In that respect, it, it, it's behavior that, how can we complete that according to what we just just heard? According to God's will, yeah. And go ahead, Marlene. I was just going to say that um, love's God. Yeah, God, God's will. And the beginning part of that, too, talked about what? It's, what kind of response is it? It's spiritual yeah, and it's and it's the mercy. Go ahead. Yeah, right. It, it begins first with what God has done, right? It, with the mercy of God, it's it's grateful, it's thankful, right? And that's always where we want to start. And gospel motivated motivated behavior in First John four nineteen. Yeah, that's uh, we love because. He first loved us. There it is, yeah. It's his love, right? That's the promise of all. Yeah, it demonstrates, right, love to God because of what he's done. And then 2 Corinthians 5.15 reads, uh, And he died for all, so that those who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died in their place and was raised again. So we could say uh, gospel motivated behavior is behavior that lives for Christ. Right? And again, because Christ died and rose for us. So in summary, there it says there's one foundational motivation for a Christian's life of sanctification, hence for Christian stewardship. Christ's love for the world as displayed by his living for us and dying for us. And then this love of God in Christ is the heart and center, right, of the gospel. So so that's that's the motivation. Now we're Going to look at some different questions here. Uh, well, we'll uh, reflection and discussion. Agree or disagree? Christians give because they love Jesus. He first loved us. Yeah. That's the only way we can. So, so Christians give. But first, because, right, Jesus first loved us, right? Versus, like, you know, yeah, it starts, it starts there. That It flows from there, right? Any other thoughts on that? I mean, it's, go ahead. It depends. Well, you, you can agree and you can disagree. Sure. That's why we love agree and disagree. So what would be the disagree part? Well, Christians are sinners. <laughs> so there are times when we give because we feel motivated, because we feel like we have to. Yes. So, there, I mean, sure. there, there, we, know it's the right thing. we know it's the right thing to do, yet we still go about it in the wrong way because we're still sinful. So there are times when we give because we get to, and there are times we give because we feel like we have to. Right. And that's just honest. Yeah, we no, right. We have to be honest with ourselves. Sure. <laughs> well, but if but the have to, you... you I guess when I think that way, it might be, I would rather use this for something else, maybe, right? Oh, I got to, like, that idea. And then when you when you, you let the new life within you dominate. You can use it as a law, though. Like, yeah. We need to do this because God said so. <laughs> or how are they going to look at me? Or yeah. how is that person? Or what is that? You know, there's all kinds of things that come into that. <laughs> yeah. It could, could be other reasons. The motivation, that. right, if we're looking at it. But then when we look back through the gospel... Right, Christ's love compels us. We we see, and then even we're going to get into this in the next one. God's promises, too, on that. Okay, and this this is actually perfect, Josh. Malachi three eight and nine. If we want to turn there real quick, because that's gonna 
uh, give us some insight into the next question, which is a pretty loaded uh, way to end. But nonetheless, comment on the following. A, a sentence in a sermon or a newsletter, this is just hypothetical, but sentence in a newsletter. It's because of your greed and selfishness that we're running a deficit in our budget. <laughs> Agree or disagree? Agree. <laughs> and... Sorry. Can you pound your fist on the pocket? Yeah. Like, come on. It's <laughs> Wag my finger. Um, what was the Malachi? Malachi 3, 8, and 9. Are you, are you there real quick, Josh? Uh, almost. Because this gives us a better way to, to phrase that. Can you want me to read it? Go ahead. All right. Uh, will a man rob God? You are robbing me. You say, how have we robbed you? In regard to the tithe and the special offering. Is what, eight and nine? Yep. You are being cursed since all of you, the whole nation, are robbing me. So, what I have in my notes, uh, it says, your greed and selfishness are robbing God of what is due for him. Right? I mean, versus our, looking at your, your, the reason why we're running a deficit in our budget. Ultimately, I mean, it's, this is a tough one, right? Um, but at the same time, I think those things within us are, like we were talking about earlier, those are the improper motivations or reasons why we wouldn't want to give, to give of what God's given to us. Yeah. I was thinking of uh, car, car analogies on top of head today for some reason. Um, if I want my car to go down the road, it must have fuel in the tank. It does me no good to sit in the driveway and think about how much driving I need to do, or how much I need to start my car, and how much better my life would be if I would be able to drive down the road. The only good thing it does is if I go to the gas station and put some fuel in the car. And so it does me no good in my life of stewardship to think about how much I need to be doing. Right? The focus right. needs to be on the fuel in the tank. How do I get more fuel in my tank? And that is, I need the gospel. Where do I go for that? Means of grace. Yeah. And so I think that's a little bit of a thinking shift for us in, in terms of focusing on behavior versus focusing on, on what causes that behavior to occur. Once the fuel's in the tank, the car pretty much takes care of itself. Right? Yeah. So. Just gotta use it. Yeah, just gotta use it. Well, and I mean, the fuel's the blood of the blood of Jesus that purifies us from all unrighteousness, right? I mean, I mean, think about that. And, and then the the treasures. Really, I mean, who do our? I was listening this week to from the Time of Grace a podcast on stewardship, and really, you know, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, right? So, really, who do our treasures? Who do our? Who does it all really belong to? God, we're just kind of like like landlords, or you know, we're, I mean, that's the steward, right? We're just using it, and when we start seeing it that way, um, right? And, and versus, yeah, not our behavior per se. It's it's what God has given to us. Let's, in view of God's mercy, give back. That's the treasure part. Now, how about this one? Christ said, "Go make disciples." He didn't say, "Go and raise money." <laughs> That's a tough one too, right? The, my notes, it, it, we money's a means of exchange, right? Meaning it, it makes it possible for us to participate in, in work through through offerings, right? We, we support through these treasures God's given to us. Um, it's a means we can support the work of the gospel. But we need we need to have it right to support it. Um, these are uh, the next next one. Unless we want to, we only have a couple more minutes, but we're we're ending with some interesting things. We need to avoid telling members to work for the church. We should be teaching them to work as the church. Thoughts on that? I think it was getting back to like what Pastor was saying. It's not that our behavior per se, right? It's not that you should not that we should be doing. Go ahead. I was going to say, it's 
saying you work for the church gives yourself a little too much importance. Like, I'm me, I'm doing this. Whereas working for the church, like one body, we're not to try to be that glory for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, we were the church is the body of believers, right? And um, he part, every one of us has a purpose within that. Um, it's not like we're just working and we have this organ as an organ. We have different roles, but we all have a purpose to work work together. Um, I like the I like the wording too. Where where for it's there's that law motivation like do this. You have to do this for the church instead of what we are as Christians. Like you are this is what believers do. We are, you know, as a body of Christ, we can't help but work as a church together. So, yeah. You just one simple word, how how big a difference that is. Well even because the first one is like it's just me. The second one is like, wait a minute, look around. We're all together doing it. Yeah, I always look too at, at uh, supporting our school. Like, yeah, my kids go here, but at the same time, I look at it as I'm supporting something else too, and supporting the people. Right? I think we all have a similar way, um, in in supporting other believers in advancing the mission. It's it's a great, and that's just one example. But we have a great, great thing here, right? In in that in what we're doing. I may not be, be there every day, but we have other people that are in supporting them and what they do. Extension of us as believers, right? And the next one, Christian stewardship then does not consist in raising money, but in raising people. Right. Obviously, that's that's the idea. That's why we're we're doing this. People, their hearts need to be raised up first. We need to be constantly uh, reborn, and and we go back again, right, to that. Where's our, where's that motivation? Yeah, that motivation, the fuel, right, uh, the means, right, and it's and and then in in the discipline, right, that we're doing in studying it and getting into the word and letting it take root within us and and constantly. Uh, letting it guide us. So uh, it says this in the notes agree in this sense people need to be raised that is nurtured and strengthened in faith and then the giving of their offerings are going to follow as work pleasing to God. Uh, one thing on that last item um, I know with uh, agree or disagree I kind of uh, when I hear that phrase kind of think back at some of the fundraising thermometers where you're tracking how much money is being raised whereas potentially it might be better to track how many people are supporting it. Um, kind of that yeah. between money versus the people that you're, you're reaching out to and assisting. But you wouldn't want to put the people's names on the no, 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 no. <laughs> 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 so like, Not like, do, do, do. Like, look at but no, I hear what you're saying because it's like this. If you just had a number of people, like, hey, I could be one of those people, right? Even if it's you know, what the of giving of my out of my poverty or giving you know, hey, whatever. Or if it's not your money, maybe it's hey, like you guys who were doing the labor and the things, you know, like all those different things, right? It's the, we, I think we might always often think of it as just a money thing, but it's not just yeah, a money yeah, thing, right? Exactly. The thermometers are. I, yeah, I hear what you're saying, because it's not about a, a dollar. You have to get to that amount. Sometimes a visual is good to get you to see, oh, yeah, we want to get there. Okay, we're but, hey, come on. Yeah, it's an interesting way of looking at it, because I could be one of those if I have the ability. Yeah. So one of my one of those congregations that Sunday school kids have these, I guess they were kind of, you call them fundraisers, but they, like, one year they did um, the Another year, they did a they dug a well, and it wasn't how much money they raised. It was like, hey, we were, had enough money to dig two wells, or we had enough money to get a cow and you know a, a dozen chickens, or whatever it was. Um, so they were concentrating, teaching the kids to concentrate more on what could we actually provide versus yeah. the monetary amount. Yeah.
that's a good way, yeah, of looking at it. Um, yeah, ways that we can support it, right? Okay, other ideas uh, or other comments were at our time. The third question really takes you back to the beginning. If you guys remember, we looked at how would you define Christian stewardship? And if you remember, we saw all those examples uh, at the beginning, right? Um, Christian steward, and, and the idea is it's, it is all those things. Uh, there's not like one just defined example of, of Christian stewardship. Uh, and if you guys see that there, right? Um, there's, there's not one that's better than all the rest, right? It's, it's a, all those things. So we can end with prayer uh, today before we head out. Gracious Lord, we give you praise and we give you thanks for saving us, for giving us salvation, for, for giving us all our sins and giving us your mercy and your grace. This truly is our greatest treasure. And with that, Lord, you also give us uh, the treasure of time and, and uh, the time we have together here in this world as believers, time that you give to us every day. You also give us abilities and great uh, many varying talents. And then you also give us treasures of wealth and so many things. All these blessings you give to us uh, in, in your grace and in your mercy. So help us as we move forward to find ways in which we can honor you uh, with all these gifts and also help others uh, come to know of your love and your mercy through these things that you've given to us. Uh, bless our, our time uh, and bring us uh, into your word again uh, where we can find more encouragement and more fuel for for our lives and, and, and for our, us as believers individually and as a, a body of, of believers here at Faith. We ask these things through Jesus, our Savior. Amen. All right. Okay, so next week is is got it here. Uh, no, we have less than two.